could you please um, explain to our um, listeners about um, NASA's discovery related to that organism that was using arsenic instead of um, phosphorus? Instead phosphorus, of phosphorus, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was an interesting. There is there's two parts to that. One is the paper itself and the work itself, and the other is the social studies of the press release and how it was handled. These are in some some sense two separate topics. The first topic is that is very interesting scientifically uh, that this group discovered an organism that could tolerate very high levels of arsenic. And what exactly the organism was doing with the arsenic is still somewhat being debated. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that it could tolerate very, very high levels of arsenic. And that's remarkable all by itself. Then there's a, a, a second story. It's a story about the story, if you will, which is how the results were presented and how the press release was organized. And there, the story is not so interesting. It's kind of kind of muddy because it, I think that uh, they did a poor job of explaining why these results are interesting. And I personally got a lot of emails from people saying, oh, is this evidence that NASA has discovered a second genesis of life here on Earth? And no, that wasn't the case. It's just that they've discovered a very interesting organism. And so, in some sense, the interesting result got overshadowed by this speculation that they had found a separate organism. And then when that turned out not to be the case, there was sort of a backlash against it. And I think it was it's an example of how not to announce results in a press conference. But the results themselves are interesting and important. Do you want to say a bit more about uh, what it is about arsenic that makes that find so remarkable? Well, arsenic, as, you, as everyone knows, especially from watching old murder mysteries, is a poison. And the reason it's a poison is because arsenic behaves like phosphorus. If you look at the table of the elements, arsenic is right below phosphorus. And so chemically, it's a little bit like phosphorus. It's enough like phosphorus that it can get into your cells where phosphorus is supposed to be and be taken as a replacement for phosphorus, but it's not enough like phosphorus to actually work like phosphorus. And so if you take in arsenic, it's a poison just for the reason that it is like phosphorus, but not quite like phosphorus. And so finding an organism that can tolerate high amounts of arsenic is interesting. What we were really looking for, what that group was really looking for, was an organism that could live completely without phosphorus and use arsenic instead entirely. Uh, and the thought was, is that maybe that would be one way to track down an organism that is not related to the rest of life on Earth and truly represents a second genesis. That is not what they found, but they did find an organism that can survive very, very high concentrations of arsenic. And that's interesting in understanding the limits of life and what kind of environments in which life can survive. Many hydrothermal environments have very high arsenic. In the Atacama Desert, for example, the runoff water from the Andes, the hydrothermal runoff water, is very high arsenic. In fact, it's a, it's a problem, and groundwater has to be treated for arsenic before uh, it's safe for human consumption. So there are environments in the solar system where one might imagine very high arsenic, and so an ability of an organism to survive in that is of interest. You've mentioned a number of times the organisms, the extremophiles here on Earth, that can survive in extreme environments. What actually are those organisms? Are they plants? Are they fungi? Archaea? What kind of things well, live in the most harsh environments on Earth? In many of the harshest environments, what we find are only bacteria, prokaryotes rather, bacteria and archaea. Uh, in hypersaline and high, high temperature and high salt and high pH and low pH, we find those kind of organisms only. They're the, they are the survivors the bacteria and the archaea, the so-called prokaryotes. But in other environments, in very dry environments, they are not the survivors. And in fact, they're uh, eukaryotes, sometimes even plants and fungi uh, and yeasts are better able to survive. And in cold and dry environments, yeasts are better. And a good example of that is uh, if you leave jam out, jam is actually a very dry substance because of the sugar the high sugar content creates very strong osmotic stress. The only organism that can live in that is yeast, and they live right on the surface. You form a mold. Jam hardly ever gets uh, infected by bacteria. They just can't live on it. It's too sweet, too 
low water activity, but molds can. So in those environments, we find this other type of life. So there's no one answer to who is the strongest, toughest life form. It depends on the environment. And temperature, these guys win. Salt, somebody else wins. And then cold and dry, it's another class of organism that wins. There's no superbug that's the best in all environments. And so hopefully you're, one of the things you mentioned before was biotechnology. If we were going to create an organism that could live on the surface of Mars, would it take the best parts from all of those and kind of throw them together? Yeah, that's an interesting prospect. And I was uh, at a synthetic biology conference a couple months ago, and I said, here's what NASA would like to order from you guys. We want you to build <laughs> a Martian superbug that can live on very low water, or tolerate very high UV, make a lot of organic matter, and to be very efficient at uh, eroding rocks. And I had a long list of properties. And I said, here, make this and, and we'll buy it. <laughs> Fantastic. What was their response? Uh, they laughed. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was a uh, organizing principle for the conversation for a while. You know, what, what does the customer want? If we're making bugs, what kind of capabilities would they want to have? So although I, I, I said it partly as a joke, the idea was also to get people thinking seriously. What do we know about life in the universe? Well, what we know for a fact is very small, just that there's life on Earth. But there are several things that lead us to be optimistic that there's life elsewhere. Uh, and those are, one, the discovery of planets around other stars. Two, the discovery of organic material in space, in comets, the stuff that life is made out of. We find it in other worlds. Three, the discovery of water on other worlds. We know there's water in Enceladus. We know there's water in Europa. We know there is water on Mars. And then The fourth thing that makes us optimistic that life is any elsewhere is the fact that we have evidence that life started on Earth very quickly. Uh, we look in the history of Earth, and life appears there very early in the fossil record. So life started soon on Earth. That's another factor that makes us optimistic that life is elsewhere. And then finally, the observation that life is made up of elements that are common. We're made up of hydrogen and oxygen and carbon and nitrogen and phosphorus and sulfur. And these are some of the most common elements in the universe. And we know that they exist on other planets and other stars. So all of that is not proof that there's life beyond the Earth, but it's all pointing us in the direction to think, yeah, it could be there. It's enough of a clues that to lead us to, to want to search. And so that's what we do. We search and we'll only know for sure when we find direct evidence. I wanted to ask you, what do you think? How do you feel? Um, when should we become a space-faring civilization? Should we do that? I think so. I think the sooner the better. When you look up at the sky at night, you can't help but wonder, what's all that stuff for? And what is our role in it? What will? How will we integrate those worlds into our human experience? What is? What are the potentials? Can we live there? Is there life there? What are the possibilities? We don't know the answer to those questions. And I think we should try to find the answer to those questions. And it is in our nature to ask those questions and to want to know the answers. So I think uh, we, sh we should push hard on it. Now, obviously, I think that because that's what I do. So it's, you're probably not surprised to hear that I think we should be doing it since that's what I spend my time doing. But I think the reasons for it are broad. And when I talk to people, even people who are not doing it as their job or, or, or are even interested in doing it as their job, they understand that, that we need to know the answer to that question. It's just like people need to investigate the cause of cancer. I don't do it, but I'm glad somebody is doing it. And I realize that we as a civilization must continue that investigation because it's an important part of improving human condition and improving the uh, ability of humans to survive. And in some sense, going into space is like that. It's an important part of what it means to be human, to investigate the universe and understand our place in it and our role in it and what our future potentials might be. Maybe, maybe our job is to spread life from Earth. Maybe our job is to rekindle life that's on Mars and died. Maybe we're all there is. And uh, if we don't take this spark and spread it, it will die with us. Maybe there's many, many, many life forms out there, and we are one of them in a crowd, and our job is to learn to get along with the neighbors. We don't know the answers to those questions, 
until we go out and search. So it sounds like finding the answers to those questions will be totally revolutionary to human society, but actually getting those answers could be quite complicated, even with new telescopes like James Webb and the Square Kilometre Array. What kind of things will we be looking for on other planets and around other stars to signify the presence of life? Yeah, well, you're certainly right. Uh, we, we, we are very impressed with our telescopes, but they're very limited in what they can do compared to the vastness of space and the distances to the nearby stars. The best we can do with stars around other planets is search for things like oxygen and ozone, signatures of active biology. Right now, that's the best hope. We hope to find planets the size of the Earth, orbiting stars kind of like our sun, and then what we do is zoom in on that and look to see, is there a signature of oxygen or ozone in that planet's atmosphere? That's the best we can do. But who knows what will happen in the future, what new technologies might come online, what new capabilities in telescopes, or, or who knows what other things that would allow us to advance further. So we have to constantly push and push and push. How is tomorrow going to look like? Well, it's hard to predict. In many ways, it'll be like today, but there will be incremental progress as we expand our understanding of the other worlds, as we expand our understanding of the universe. There'll be a slow, gradual realization. I don't think it'll be a eureka moment where we'll wake up one day and go, aha, now we understand. It'll be a slow increase in knowledge as bit and piece gets added, much the same way that, say, medicine has advanced over the last hundred years. There was not a sudden point where we went from not being able to cure disease to being able to cure them all. It's just slow, steady progress. Uh, and I think that's the way space exploration is going to come as well. Slow, steady progress uh, and human exploration as well. It's going to be small step by small step. This year, um, World Space Week Association is celebrating 50 years of human presence in space. What would you like to send to our um, audience? What message would you like them to, to carry with them? I, I guess I would like to say that the 50 years is important, that we need to think in terms of long periods. We need to think of staying. I, I was giving a talk recently, and I pointed out that we often say, to quote Star Trek, to boldly go. But that's really not the challenge. The challenge isn't to boldly go. The challenge is to boldly stay, to be able to stay. And we need to be able to plan for habitats on the moon and bases on Mars where we're thinking this base is going to be here for 50 years, 100 years. We need to think in those kind of time frames. And now that the space program is in some sense 50 years old, we need to start thinking, what are we going to do for 100 years? Can we build a, a moon base and plan to operate it continuously for 100 years? Let's think in that way. Let's not think about going to the moon or going to Mars. Let's think about staying on the moon, staying on Mars. And 50 years becomes a convenient way to cast, frame that. 50 years, we want to 50 more years. In, in politics, sometimes around here, they say four more years, four more years, referring to a presidential term. Well, I'm saying 50 more years, 50 more years. I want a base on the moon, and I want scientists and students in it for 50 years. And I want us to plan that now, so we design it to last for 50 years. Well, if you're ever looking for volunteers. Yes, here <laughs> okay. we are. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. McKay. Thank you for um, participating in our podcast. We Excellent. really do appreciate it. It's been absolutely magnificent talking to you. You're an absolute right. inspiration, and please do keep up the fantastic work that you're doing. Thank you. You too, and it was fun talking to you. And finally, we have to finish up by saying a huge thanks to all the people who contributed to this podcast and made it possible. First, thanks to the New Zealand Science Media Centre for letting us use their podcast recording equipment. And thank you to the amazing composer Rian Sheehan for the intro and outro themes. Thanks to the Kiwi Space Foundation. And thank you to World Space Week Association. And finally, a huge thank you from the bottom of our hearts to Dr. Chris Mackay from NASA for his wonderful contributions to our podcast today. And for explaining to us just how tenuous life's grasp on the universe actually is. We'll see you next time.